Welcome. I'm Paul, the self-proclaimed tactical historian. And on the show, we discuss those men and women who serve in some of the most dangerous occupations, be it walking a beat in New York City or flying fighter jets. Um, we like to discuss those daring raids that put Hollywood to shame, deeds that make Mission Impossible look quite possible. One of those raids is arguably the greatest raid of all time, the raid on St. Nazaire. With me to discuss the topic is Peter Lush author of Wing Chariot, a complete account of the RAF support role during the audacious commando raid on St. Nazaire, March 1942. He's been studying the battle for over 50 years and has been a battlefield tour guide around St. Nazaire for over 30 years and has produced a few DVDs in regards. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome, Paul, and I'm pleased to talk to you. Well, I think we'll just kick it off here. Um, can you briefly describe the situation leading up to the raid and the objective of the raid? The, the situation at the time was that um, obviously we'd been kicked out of Europe. Uh, we were making little raids on uh, Norway and France and places like that just to keep the spirit alive. Um, but the raid on San Jose was basically a part of the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, which you may remember, Winston Churchill said it was the only battle uh, that he feared he might lose. And of course, it was a vital battle. And you in the States were sending us over a lot of ordnance and supplies and food and things. And we had to keep the Atlantic open. And the importance of San Nazaire really became apparent um, with the sinking of the Bismarck. The Bismarck was sunk on the 24th of May, 1941. And uh, it was decimated shipping in the North Atlantic. Um, it was damaged um, in the steering gear and was making uh, for port, uh, for repairs. And the only port on the western seaboard of, of, of um, Europe that could accommodate it was at saint uh, And the Admiral on um, Bismarck uh, sent a, a five point signal to his headquarters. And the fifth point of it was, um, I'm heading for saint -Nazaire. And this became um, the reason why Saint Nazaire showed up as important to the Germans. Otherwise, it would have had to go through the Iceland Faroes Gap round the north of Scotland, which is a very narrow gap, very dangerous. We could cover it, uh, and it probably wouldn't survive. It's the only, only way it could get back to Germany for repairs. Well, when the Bismarck was finally sunk, of course, attention then turned to the Tirpitz. Now, the Tirpitz was another fellow pocket battleship. And it had just finished um, working up in the Baltic and was about to break out from the North Sea into the Atlantic, where it would have taken the place of the Bismarck. And Churchill and his planners worked out that if the dock in San Nazaire was destroyed, uh, there would be no safe haven for it if it was um, damaged in the Atlantic. And so by um, destroying the, the dock at San Nazaire, they would stop the Tirpitz breaking out into the Atlantic. And, and so that was why we attacked San Nazaire. And um, sorry, you note the possessive pronoun there, we, we attacked San Nazaire. <laughs> and um, a, a plan was drawn up um, to do just that. Now, um, that is the basic of, of where the war was at the time San Nazaire was planned. Right. So my next question would be like, so now we know what happened up until that point to put San Nazaire in the crosshairs, if you will, of the yes. Brits. Um, so what what pushed that forward? What was the plan after that? Um, the, the plan um, was to take an old American destroyer. It was one of the 50 Lend-Lease destroyers that you sent us. Um, it was um, born as USS Buchanan, and it became over here HMS Campbelltown. Um, they took off all the superstructure, mounted eight Ehrlichens on bandstands, raked the funnels back, took two funnels off, raked the two remaining funnels back to make it look like a German Merva class destroyer. And they packed the bows with three tons of explosive in the form of, of 24 Mark 7 depth charges. And they placed those uh, just behind the, the forward gun 
which would be the first point of resistance when it, it, it smashed through the case at Saint-Nazaire. They put um, commandos on the Campbelltown uh, who would disembark to attack targets in the area of the dockyard, um, which perhaps would be best left to later when I talk you through the raid, um, and to attack other targets in the dockyard. Um, they took 16 motor launches, which was a little coastal craft. They took about 15 crew and about 15 commandos on each. Uh, and they were heavily armed, um, both for protection and for demolition. Uh, and they were to attack other targets in the dockyard. Um, Just out of curiosity, I know I've heard a lot about German U-boats. Um, were those possibly a target as well? Definitely not. No, okay. it's a common misconception. In fact, if you search um, uh, any of the search engines or, on your computer, you will find some that say it was attack on the submarine pens. It was not. Um, one of the side effects of the raid, if it was carried out successfully, would be to make the, the submarine basin in front of the submarine pens in San Jose tidal. And that would just annoy them. It meant that, that at certain times of the day and night, they couldn't get in and out. But there was no intention to attack the submarines, the U-boats at all. Well, I think that was very important to clear up because as you said, I think that's a pretty common misconception. You see that online indeed, everywhere. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify, they're actually going to ram Use this as a ram? They're going to ram. They're going to use this boat in. It's not coming back. <clears throat> the commandos realized that and uh, made sure that they didn't leave too many provisions on it. So they ate pretty well on the way out. <laughs> um, they reduced the um, crew down from a normal 150 to about 75 because they had to get those back somehow. Uh, and um, yes, that was the idea. They drove it. Lieutenant Commander Beatty was in charge. Um, he drove it at about 20 knots into the Kassoon. Um, Kaysen. So th there, is, <laughs> there is a school of thought that says it's called a Kassoon, but it's not. And I got so into the habit of calling it a Kassoon that I can't get out of it. It's just a Kaysen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, right. He drove it at about 20 knots and it was about 30 feet wide. You could have a double... Um, carriageway across the top of it and it stuck out a foot or two on the opposite side so it really hit it and they were never going to drag it off although eventually um, they did uh, fire scuttling charges so that it settled at the stern that the germans would never haul it off was there any exfil plan how are they planning to get back home well the idea was for the um, launches to the, the 16 motor launches to land their troops at their um, landing points with two landing points um, and then to uh, lay off into the estuary um, and await the call to go back in, pick them up, drive home. Simple, but it wasn't going to work. Yeah. The big problem was that um, Sanders Air is about 400 miles from Plymouth, where they, sorry, sorry, from Falmouth, where they started. And they couldn't get there with their normal petrol tanks. So they had to have 500 gallon auxiliary tanks on deck. Petrol. Yeah. And their wooden boats. And you can work that one out, can't you? Yeah. That's a recipe for disaster. Fire killed probably more people than the Germans. Um, if I tell you that there were 169 casualties amongst the sailors and commandos, and of those 169, 101 of them have no known graves. They were lost in the river. Wow. Wow. It, it's quite a proportion, isn't it? Absolutely. And, 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 and it really sets out the, the nature of how the attack unfolded. Have you got the order of battle for the attack? Yes, I have that in front of me. Um, this is how they formed up um, when they took their last turn towards San Nazaire, about an hour or more out. Um, they had left Falmouth um, two days earlier on the 26th, about half past two in the afternoon, and they sailed in, in um, 
an arrowhead formation um, to mimic an anti-submarine sweep. Um, as it happened, they did on the way out encounter a, a U-boat uh, and that had quite an effect on the, on the battle because they got this submarine to uh, dive and it stayed there for a long time. And Commander Ryder in charge of the whole force, um, when they left it and left it down there, they set off on a course that appeared they were going to Gibraltar. Um, and when this submarine actually came up, U-boat actually came to the surface, it reported to San Nazaire that it had disturbed a mine laying operation. Now, the effect of this was in San Nazaire were five German, they called them motor torpedo boats. They were a bit more like uh, um, destroyers. Now, if we'd have gone in there, um, with those boats there, we'd have been blown out of the water, the lot of us, Campbelltown and the 16 motor launches. Um, but when they reported a mine laying operation, they sent these uh, motor torpedo boats out to find these mines and to find this mine laying force. So this erroneous message from this U-boat commander actually took these five boats out of the fairway at San Nazaire, which allowed us to get in. Quite strange. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, they formed up um, eventually into this um, force that you can see on your plan. Uh, the MGB 314 was in the lead. That had the commanding officer of both the, naval, both the whole force, the naval force, and the commanders on board, followed by um, two motor launches on either side that carried no commandos, but they carried torpedoes. Uh, and they had a roaming job to go up the estuary and fire up any, any target at will that they found. There were reported to be two tankers, for example, in the estuary. And uh, they went off looking for those. In the event, they didn't find them, mainly because they were in the, the San Jose dock, the Normandy dock in San Jose. And they did come to a little bit of grief when we blew up the dock. <laughs> then followed, as you can see, two uh, lines of MLs. Now, they were motor launches. They were all carrying commandos for specific tasks. The um, port column were going to land at the old mole, which you will see on your other chart. You see the old mole there? The starboard column were going to land at the old entrance. And the Campbelltown was going to go straight ahead and embed itself on the southern caisson. They um, came to a lot of grief. Um, funny enough, the first boat to land at the old mole wasn't supposed to. It was in the port column, in the starboard column. And it was hit in the steering gear, veered across um, behind the Campbelltown, hit the old mole, caught fire and drifted out to sea. So that was the first one come to grief. No commandos landed. The commanding officer of uh, that particular launch ended up in, in Colditch Castle uh, and escaped. Um, Lieutenant Commander Billy Stevens, he actually escaped and got home from Colditch. The second launch up um, had in fact broken down at sea and it had dropped back and it had been, his, his commander had been picked up by another um, spare launch. And so it was out of position. Now this was important because the, the first two launches carried commandos uh, equipped for assault. Now I should have perhaps said earlier that these commandos have got three specific tasks, they're into three specific groups. Um, each one is about an officer and five other ranks. And some of them are an officer and 12 other ranks. Now the officer and 12 other ranks were equipped heavily armed um, to go ashore first 
silencer defenses. And interestingly, certainly from your point of view as an American, some of the, the arms they carried were in fact um, Tommy guns that had been provided by the mayor of Chicago who had uh, liberated them from some of his gangsters. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, and can you also talk a little bit about, um, for anyone who's listening to this who don't know exactly who the commandos are, I think this is a good part, just to take a quick detour a little bit and talk about who they yes, were. Yes, indeed. Um, when we were kicked out of Europe, obviously Churchill was not uh, prepared to let the war just sort of go to sleep. Uh, and they formed what they called independent companies um, to uh, attack various targets um, in, well, on the, on the um, Atlantic coast of um, Europe. Um, so the Germans didn't go to sleep either. And these independent companies formed, uh, uh, took part in raids, particularly in Norway. Yeah, a couple of places in Norway, Varkso and the Lofoten Islands, were producing fish oil which the Germans were shipping back to Germany um, to make um, as part of their atomic weapons program. And so the independent companies went over there. Um, the Navy took them over there. Uh, and interestingly, um, they had RAF cover, which was a bit of a no-no at San Jose. Um, and they were quite successful. They, they, they blew up fish oil plants over there and set fire to them. And, uh, but interestingly, one of the things that happened was that they liberated the German naval signal book. Now that was interesting because uh, just jumping ahead a bit, when the force went up the river, they were challenged by um, a signaler from ashore saying, who are you? And um, Signalman Pike, who was, um, on MGB 314, right at the head of the thing, um, had the German signal book that they captured in Norway and he was able to answer them. And he said, well, you know, and he managed to um, keep them quiet until the force actually got within six minutes of hitting the caisson. So that was just a little thing that came forward from the early raids of the independent companies in Norway that helped out at saint -Lazare. Well, that kind of answers any questions on how people wonder how this force could actually get so close um, that yes. was because of that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the independent companies were quite large and uh, later they were broken up into commandos, which, which is a, a number of um, soldiers. Um, I forget the exact number, but there were um, at least 12 of them. Uh, and members of most of them were picked to go to San Jose, mainly because each commando had a demolition group who were trained in demolitions. So rather than take just one commando, um, they pinched all the demolition groups out of all the other commandos. So that they went from one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, and 12 commandos, all sent people to San Jose. Two commando were the heavily armed ones, and they did all the fighting. That's sort of the origin of the commandos. They went into the Channel Islands. They did a pinprick raid somewhere in northern France, it escapes me. So, you know, they, they kept the Germans on their toes. Now, the commandos, they, they also received specialized training, right? They weren't just your average infantrymen. Oh, they did indeed. They trained in Scotland. Um, a place called Loch Eilort. Um and they trained in all sorts of things, particularly fitness, arms, uh, demolitions. Uh, they they were highly mobile. They never transported anywhere. Um, when you when they arrived in Scotland, the the um, the training centre was six or more miles seven six seven miles from the rain st train station they walked they marched never transported anywhere and they could cover vast dis distances fit as anything now these commandos uh i guess because they're training in in scotland i've heard that some of them were wearing kilts is this true 
That is absolutely true. Um, not because they trained in Scotland. One of the funny things about the commanders at the time of the Sanders Air Raid was they, they had no specific uniform. Um, and because they were volunteers from all the different regiments of the British Army, they all wore their own um, headgear and regimental badges. Um, one troop of number two commando was drawn from what was known as the Liverpool Scottish Regiment. So it was an English regiment from Liverpool, but formed of Scottish people. And on the way up the river, um, they asked their commanding officer if they could wear their kilts into battle. Uh, and um, the commanding officer was called Roy, Donald Roy, uh, and he realised that some of these guys were going to get killed, sort of granted them their last wish, and that is why some of them went ashore wearing a kilt. Liverpool Scottish soldiers. Oh, I was just curious because uh, definitely a very unique sight. <laughs> Um, my own experience is that if a Scotsman's wearing his kilt, he fights better. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Uh, and that could well um, apply to turnout time at the local pub. <laughs> fantastic. That was sort of the origin of the commandos. Uh, uh, just to go back to where I was, I said that right. they, they were in these groups, uh, an officer and 12 men in the assault parties. Um, and carrying these uh, uh, Tommy guns from Chicago. The other, so that was assault. The other two groups were demolition and protection. Now the demolition boys were in groups and the protection were in groups of about an officer and five other ranks. And the demolition guys carried ashore about 60 pounds of kit on their backs. Uh, you know, demolitions, um, cables, detonators, and so on. Uh, so they weren't able to particularly f defend themselves, but they did carry um, a pistol for, for personal defense. Uh, the demolition guys were, sorry, the protection guys to protect the demolitionists while they were at work were heavily armed, the same as the assault parties. Um... Yep. Can you take us through the steps of when they finally make contact with the Germans? Yeah, well, we, we, we dealt with the first two um, uh, boats to right, sort of come right. to grief at the top. Uh, uh, and having explained to you the commandos and how they're um, armed, you will see now that the, the first boats were carrying the assault parties to um, silence the defences. But of course, they came to grief. So when those boats that did get ashore, got ashore, uh, the, the Germans were still very much alive and kicking. But the upshot of this uh, was that um, only one launch from each column got its men ashore. So, so now you can see how all the um, casualties mounted in the um, estuary itself. So th those those other ships were were hit, or those boats were being hit before they could even drop off the, their troops. Yes, and almost almost without exception, caught fire. Petrol in a mahogany boat, devastating. Guys I know who survived say the whole sea was on fire. Um. The ones going in were sailing through uh, burning petrol on the surface of the river and seeing their mates struggling and shouting in it and saying, we'll come back for you, knowing full well they couldn't. It was devastating. But we, we did get two boats ashore. Um, what I'll perhaps do next is to ask you to look at the map, I, the plan I sent you. Yes. Uh, and that'll... I can give you from that a brief outline of what the, the plan was. Now you've got um, two areas, one's colored yellow, one's colored a, a dirty pink. Started life as orange, but it's now a dirty pink. Um, 
you've got the old mole, the old entrance, and the southern case. And they are the three landing points. If you look at bridge B, got it? Yep. Um, there's three explosions I've shown in there. They are, there's a bridge, a bridge D, a bridge at bridge B, and in between there's two or three lock gates. And the idea was to blow all those. At the other end of the dock is bridge M, um, to land and blow that. And you can see now that if they blow that, they have isolated that island of the dockyard from the town and that would cut off any German um, counterattack. Bearing in mind that within the town of Saint Nazaire and within probably three hours call were probably 10,000 German troops. And they would have to try to accomplish this already with more than half their uh, you know, yes. uh, task force is already gone and out of the fight. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'll perhaps come to that in just a moment, if I can sort of set the scene. The yeah. idea then was to, to, to carry out these explosions in the yellow area and the pink area. Campbelltown would hit the dock. They'd blow up all the targets in the pink area which included the two winding huts, one at each end of the dock that pulled the case in and out. The difference between a case and a lock gate is that a case and slide sideways into a, a recess, whereas lock gates open like doors. These were caissons. So they had winding huts at each end uh, and uh, just close to the southern winding hut is the pumping house that filled and emptied the lock. All those were targets for commandos from Campbelltown. When they had carried that out, um, another party would have landed from Campbelltown, which happened to be Donald Roy and his, his Scots in their kilts, would capture and hold Bridge G. Can you see there's a soldier on top of it? When the commanders had done all their um, demolitions in the pink area, they would withdraw through Bridge G. The commandos in the yellow area would meet them at the red circle. The idea was to all rendezvous there. They would then blow Bridge G, so they're now all comfortably ensconced in the yellow area. The launches would come back into the old mole, pick everybody up and go home. But one boat only landed at the old mall, and they didn't reach their target. Wow. So no targets in the yellow area were attacked. One boat landed at the old entrance. They didn't reach their targets either. So no targets were blown up from those landing at the old entrance. The only success came from those who landed from the Campbelltown. Well, obviously, they were so much better protected in the river. It was a, an iron battleship. Uh, it was probably diesel driven. It wouldn't catch fire so easy. Uh, and they actually uh, hit the Cassoon at about 20, 20 knots, one thirty-four in the morning. They were due to land at um, 1.30. They were four minutes late. And it's interesting, the commander BT turned to the guy next door to him and said, there we are, four minutes late. And they'd sailed for two, they'd sailed for two days. And he had to endure, after the war, he had to endure every time he walked into the mess in the Navy, he said, oh, he's BT, four minutes late. And, and it, it, you know, it stuck with him. Typical British humor. <laughs> That's fantastic. But yeah. um, and and can you just remind us who Beatty is exactly? He's the one. Beatty was a captain of Campbelltown. He right, was a career uh, career sailor. He joined the. He was a son of um, a parson, a vicar, a priest. I don't know what you call them. Um, 
and uh, he's born in about 1908 and in 1925 he joined the navy so he was a career officer uh, and he was um captain of the campbelltown on this ex expedition um interestingly um he he dropped off the commanding officer because he was felt to be um, too old the commanding officer of campbelltown and so he was stood down and and uh, bt was parachuted in um and a very good job he made of it so then um the commandos landed straight away from there and they blew up the southern winding hut which was very interesting they um a, a group of um lieutenant i think he was and four other ranks they got to the winding hut and, and all the planning they'd done over all the months they'd done, nobody ever thought that it would be locked. So they'd come all this way to blow this place up and nobody had bought the key. And they found a window open, so they climbed into the window and they set the charges and um, pulled the igniters, retired to a safe distance, and nothing happened. Now, the first law of demolitions is. Uh, if it doesn't blow up first time, don't whatever you do go in again. They did. They went back in through the window. They reset their igniters, pulled the um, pulled the fuses, and uh, you know, set their fuses and pulled the igniters rather, uh, and retired again. And the whole thing blew up. So that was target number one. Uh, next door to it is the pumping station now the pumps are four great impeller pumps and they were 40 foot underground uh, and a guy called lieutenant chant uh, and four sergeants who came from norfolk it was their task to blow it up and they went down into the uh, into the um, cavern underneath this pumping station where these pumps were and each one was to attack one pump and each one was to attack the same part of each pump so that uh, the Germans couldn't come along and bastardize uh, a pump or two by taking parts from one to the other. Uh, and cutting a long story short, they were very successful in that. They blew it up, the whole floor above them. They, they got out, the floor above them collapsed down on top of the pumps. Uh, they were absolutely destroyed. Um, at the far end of the dock, if you look at your map, you can see from the explosion um, at the northern Kasum there, there's a like a channel and then a little square on the end of it. That's the channel that the gate draws back into uh, and the pumping station is on the end of it. And uh, that was the target of a guy called um, Corin Purden. And Corin I knew very well. Um, he was an uh, um, officer in two commando. Um, he was a, an Irishman, can't remember his, oh, uh, Royal, Royal Irish Regiment, I think. Anyways, he never, an Irish Regiment. And he had four other ranks with him, and he got there, and he found the door locked as well. Actually, Chant found the door locked of the um, pumping station as well. But uh, they blew the lock off and went in. Corin Purden watched too many Wild West shows, and he tried to shoot the lock off. But all he did was to spray ricochets over his men and they eventually broke in with a sledgehammer and they went in and blew that up and they then withdrew over bridge g which donald roy had held for nearly an hour where the soldier is okay bridge g uh, and went down to the rendezvous now so, all the time yeah. they're doing this just to paint the picture uh they're all under fire right Oh, gosh, yes. And the Germ so, so who did the Germans have exactly stationed here? Uh, do we know who they were facing exactly? Were they just naval personnel or? Um, they were naval personnel because the Germans had this unusual idea that um, soldiers guarded um, soldiers barracks, Navy gar uh, guarded naval installations, and the Luftwaffe guarded airfields uh we didn't do it that way and i probably you didn't either um but that meant that they were naval troops um 
probably not the best because they were busy fighting uh, in other, had they gone into Russia by then? I think they might have done chronology again. Um, so they weren't the best, but they were there and they had um, um, soldiers within the town and fairly close at hand, probably up to three hours away uh, on whom they could call. Wow. Wow. And so the commandos, they get to the rendezvous point and what happens from there? This is the first time they saw the river and the river was on fire. Colonel Newman, um, he was uh, in charge of all the, the army personnel, the commandos. Uh, he was a surveyor from Essex and he, um, he was a colonel in the Essex regiment. Essex is an English county. We had county regiments in those days. <clears throat> and he said, mm, looks like the Navy's let us down again. There goes our transport. More British humour. <laughs> and so they decided to break out of the dockyard. Now, going straight up from the old mole to Bridge D, you see, it looks like quite a clear run. Um, that's known as Old Town Place. And it was a pretty hot spot. Um, there, were gun there were ships in the submarine basin. And they could bring fire to bear on it. There was um, a quadruple um, 20 millimeter Ehrlichan on top of the Frigo. I don't know whether you can see the Frigo, but if you look where it says bridge D, the figure D, above that's a square, and above that's a square with writing on. The Frigo. That is another American installation, funnily enough. And it was built in about 1916 to house all the um, frozen goods that were bought over from America with the troops going to the Western Front in the First World War. And the, the Americans entered the First World War through Saint-Nazaire. I mean, it's obviously coming across the Atlantic, it's one of the first places you come to. And that building, uh, the Frigorifique, it was called, or Le Frigo, and it was an old um, cold storage for American food coming in with the troops in the First World War, 1916. But on top of there was a very dangerous gun and a, a quadruple um, 20 millimeter Ehrlichan. And that absolutely commanded that old town place. So they had to work their way through all the buildings in, in the dockyard there and make a dash for Bridge D. Um, they lost guys on the way, um, wounded and killed, uh, but several of them got across it and into the town. Uh, and then they had to make their way as best they could um, to find their way home. Now, it might sound strange. Um, the RAF seemed to be the best at escaping or seemed to um, be good at it, mainly because uh, flying over enemy territory, if they were shot down, well, then they needed those skills. And so before uh, we went into San Nazaire, they had uh, a lecture from an RAF officer about escaping. And they were told that, you know, if they found themselves stuck there with no transport home, they would have to walk home via Spain. I mean, that sounds incredible, but they really believed they could do it. And that is what they set out to do. This was their commando training. Um, great stamina, great skill. Um, and five people actually did walk across France to Spain and Gibraltar and got home. I, you know, it, if it wasn't true, I don't think anyone would believe you. If you wrote this as a novel, people would say, ah, it's not possible. Not possible. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have to do some edits. It's just not, not re uh, reasonable. You know, it's not believable. Yeah. Uh, I told you earlier about trivia. There's another little trivia here. Um, George Wheeler was one of the guys who walked about 250 miles across um, France, got to Spain and Gibraltar and home. And he was a very good friend of mine because he lives. Um, if I look out of my office window here, I can all but see his house. 
and he was born there. So I got to know George very well. Um, he was determined not to be captured and neither was he. Um, he walked as far as Chateau where he was put on a, a bus uh, to Aze, and then he put on a bus and got to Chateau Roux, put on a train and got to Toulouse. Uh, and in Toulouse, he was helped by the resistance uh, and he finally got to Gibraltar and home. And he was decorated for his escape. He, he won a military medal. And he told me quite proudly that when he went to Buckingham Palace to receive his medal, the king said to him, oh, Wheeler, well done. Um, I understand you escaped, sir. No, sir. But I was told you escaped. No, sir, I wasn't captured. That Yes, I love it. I love it. That's the style. That's oh, real that commando George. right there. Yeah, that was George, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't captured. Would this be a good time to uh, talk about as well as maybe the German reaction? Do we know what was the reaction by the Germans on the aftermath of all of this? Well, Hitler was furious naturally um they individually it was quite interesting they chatted um quite friendly in a friendly way with with some of those who captured um they swapped photographs of their families and things like that oh this is my wife back home in berlin or wherever and one thing that was seemed to be quite common was that the germans actually um, praised the audacity of the raid. They just never expected, you know, that far into France, them to rock up uh, in the middle of the night sort of thing, you know. Uh, and, and they were quite um, um, complimentary about that. Um, they dismissed it in initially, and there's another very nice story about um, Commander Beatty. Commander Beatty, uh, the, the crew of Campbelltown were take, um, climbed off, were, half of them were taken off by Rodier in his launch, um, but it was blown up in the river and uh, everybody got into the water and one of them was um, Beatty. Another incidentally was a guy called Tibbets, Nigel Tibbets, and he um, was very sad last because it was him that had armed Campbelltown. Uh, and by a strange chance, um, when they were steering for the, the Caisson, um, the, um, oh, what do you call him? Anyway, the, the guy that was steering was shot dead. Um, another guy stood up to take his place and steer the ship. And he was shot. And um, Montgomery, who was a, uh, an army officer, stepped up and somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, I'll take that old chap. And it was Tibbets. And so in, in a nice sort of um, conjunction of circumstance, that the guy who was at the helm when it hit the Campbelltown was the guy who had armed it with these um, 24 Mark Seven depth charges. Um, they were taken off uh, from the side of Campbelltown and told to set off at home, PDQ. But they were blown out of the water. Tibbets was lost, but Beatty was captured. And there's a lovely photograph of him. I think it's in my DVD, um, uh, looking pretty wet and got a blanket round his shoulders, being um, interrogated by German officers. And the German officer was saying to him, he said, you British must be stupid if you think that you can destroy our dock uh, with a flimsy destroyer. Uh, and Beatty recalled that at that moment, there was a rather large explosion. Uh, he said the windows came in and the, the whole building shook. And he said, I think that probably answers your question. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, a nice little, uh, you know, um, I can't think of the word I want, but you know, the circumstances come together that that should happen. Yes, yes. And uh, Beatty would receive the uh, Victoria Cross, right? That's right. 
Now, the, the award was made um, soon after the raid when, of course, he was in prison war camp. Uh, and the Germans made quite a fuss about it. They, they paraded the, um, the British prisoners uh, and the um, commandant rode in, I believe, on a white horse and announced uh, that he was pleased to say that His Majesty the King had granted the Victoria Cross to Lieutenant Commander Beatty. Uh, and I've got a feeling, if I remember rightly, that um, the celebrations finished up with Beatty riding the, the commandant's white horse around the compound. But of course, it, it couldn't be presented to him until he came home after the war. Uh, and he duly went up to Buckingham Palace to get it. And interestingly, one of the fellow recipients, there were three of them, I can't remember the third one, but the second one was Godfrey Place, who was one of the um, mini torpedo, uh, miniature torpedo guys who drove these one-man torpedoes to blow up the turpits in Norway. He was one of those and he was awarded, he was presented with his BT at the same time as BT. Wow. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, talking about the aftermath, what would you say were the uh, successes of the raid, the takeaway of the raid, as far as uh, Britain was concerned, the Allies were concerned? Well, in one sentence, the Tirpitz never came into the Atlantic. So that was the object, and 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 it was achieved, right? And so the yeah, even though there was such a, a great great loss, uh, um, with uh, casualties, great casualties, right? They were still able to accomplish what they had to do, which is outstanding. Yeah, it's it's what I call the harsh accountancy of war. We lost one hundred and sixty nine men at Saint Nazaire. When the hood went down, when the Bismarck sunk HMS Hood, which was the pride of the British Navy, of the 1,316 men on board, only three survived. Now that's, okay, 169 men, but it's on the right side of the balance sheet, isn't it? If by keeping the Tirpitz out of the Atlantic, we had saved that many lives, it was a worthwhile operation of war. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And definitely those guys who you know, went on the raid believed in it, and that's why they did that. So that yes. is, it is yes. it's amazing. It's amazing what the, uh, heroes they were. There was a great urgency for action amongst the commanders. They were highly trained. It's a bit like a racehorse. You train him up and he never has a race. Um, and they had had so many operations cancelled that they were just raring to go. They just couldn't wait. One of the big losses um, on the German side was that there were reckoned to be several hundred Germans on the Campbelltown when she went up. They all took their girlfriends on to show them uh, how stupid the British were. And they looked for the, uh, a charge, but they never found it. It had been so well concealed, it had been encased in concrete, and the fuses were hidden in the legs of the wardroom table. It went, it was supposed to go up about half past, wait a minute, half past one, two, about half past three. It didn't go up to about half past ten the next morning. Uh, and it had experimental fuses which acted with um, acid working on copper wire. Uh, and so the timing of it was uh, a bit iffy. There, are, there is what is known as the legend of San Nazaire, which is absolutely not true. Uh, and that is that um, one version says that two commando officers went on, short, went on board and detonated by hand and blew themselves up. The other version says two naval officers went on board uh, and blew it up. Well, that, that defeats the story anyway, because it's got two versions. The truth of the matter is, I should imagine the only person who would have been able to do that would have been Tibbets, and he was dead in the river. Right. Um, I think we've covered the raid pretty well. 
But <laughs> as as we've noticed, we've sort of left out the RAF, and that's sort of your bread and yes, butter, isn't indeed. it? Indeed, <laughs> and it is it is very much a separate thing. The RAF had a bad time at Dunkirk, so they say. Um, the problem with the RAF is nobody sees them. They go home every night. They fly off the next night, fly home again. They go over the over your heads. Nobody sees them. At Dunkirk, I nearly got very cross with a man in Weymouth last year because he said, oh, here they come. Obviously got nothing else on this afternoon when the RAF contingent moved by. He said, where were they at Dunkirk? Well, I'll tell you where they were. They were, sh they were sh shooting up airfields. The Royal Air Force lost 700 and odd aircraft at Dunkirk. They destroyed over 1,300 German planes by shooting up the airfields to stop them getting to the beaches. Now, the same sort of story, um, same sort of attitude pertained at Saint Nazaire. The um, RAF patrolled the Bay of Biscay for two days the two days that the force were traveling across it to San Nazaire. And it, because it was well known that if a, a, a U-boat commander heard aeroplanes, he would dive. And that was how they only encountered one. And this particular one, U-593, commanded by a guy called Gerd Kelbling, had been operating off Liverpool and got damaged and he was limping home on the surface because he's, he's submersion equipment had been damaged. The only way he could dive was by getting the crew to run to the front end of the boat uh, to take it down. Uh, uh, and so this was why they encountered this particular one. He couldn't dive. So for two days, the RAF patrolled over the Bay of Biscay. Now, I would guess that not one of the attacking force knew that. Similarly, um, on, on retiring from San Nazaire, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven launches got out, four had to scuttle, three got all the way back to Falmouth. And during that two days, the RAF were again patrolling the Bay of Biscay for four days, virtually for every hour of daylight there was an RAF plane over the Bay of Biscay. Now, I didn't know that till I wrote my book. And when I was looking for something new to write about San Nazaire, I thought, oh, let's have a look at the RAF. Now, the big bone of contention was that whilst the force was approaching San Nazaire, they were going to have a, a diversion raid by the RAF on, on the town itself. For an hour, they don't take, don't keep me to that. For a time before the raid, they were going to bomb the docks. Quarter of an hour before the commanders were due to go in, they were going to move to the other end of the um, shipbuilding area there, uh, a bit away from the commandos area of operations, uh, and bomb that. And the idea was to keep the civilian population in their shelters so that they weren't killed and to keep the um, anti-aircraft gunners occupied so they couldn't, I don't know whether you know, but a 20 millimeter Ehrlichan can be depressed and used against troops as well as anti-aircraft. So if they kept them pointing at the sky, it would help the troops going in. Um, they were given impossible tasks, not tasks, they're given simple task, but they're given impossible conditions. The first was that they mustn't fly below 6,000 feet. The second was that they must not bomb unless they could see the target. The third was that they must only drop one bomb at a time. And the fourth was that they must not kill a French civilian. There was three layers of cloud 10 tenths cloud above San Nazaire, about four to 6,000 feet, 10 to 12,000 feet, and probably there was another layer as well, three layers. They couldn't see the target. I think only three or four 
aircraft dropped their bombs because they couldn't see the target, not allowed to drop them. One at a time, you had how many aircraft? 60 aircraft going around in circles, not dropping bombs. Now, would you believe that that brought home the bacon, as we say? It, it, it succeeded in doing what they were meant to do, and that is form uh, a diversion. Now, exactly a month before, we'd raided Bruneval on the, on, the, on the North French coast. We dropped paratroops in there, and we had stolen some vital parts of the German radar system. And it was the first time we had ever used paratroopers. So a month later, there's planes going round and round and round, and no bombs are dropping. And the defend the, the guy in charge of the aircraft defense of the anti-aircraft defense of Sunders Air said, I smell a rat. Beware landing. Now, a lot of the feeling against the RAF was that this pointed to landings from the sea. But documents that I found when I was writing my book uh, showed that when he talked about beware landings, he was talking about beware of paratroop landings. And he said, at no time did we expect an attack from the sea. I told you, 400 sailing miles from Falmouth. They're not going to expect it, are they? And such was their conviction that this was the case, that on the opposite side of the Loire, the, on the south bank of the Loire, there was a, um, a, a German um, flak commander, um, Captain Leutnant, Berhenna, and he's idling away there looking at the river through his binoculars and he sees a ship a battleship and 16 launches coming up the river so he gets on the phone to headquarters and he says there is a battleship and 16 launches coming up the river what do they tell him you are a Luftwaffe officer you keep your eyes on the sky and mind your own business So the RAF succeeded, a bit by accident, but they did. Wow, that I is, found it a fascinating uh, story. Yeah, that is fantastic, and yeah. you know, it's it's amazing what they were like. You said it's a bit of an accident, but it's amazing that they were able to accomplish <laughs> such a thing yeah. given those restrictions. Um, yeah. You know, it it's amazing uh, the sort of can do attitude, and you know, they work with what they got. But did the did the RAF also help? with the intel gathering uh, as far as when they were initially about to plan the raid? Not specifically. Um, we had a section called the PRU, P-R-U, Photographic Reconnaissance Unit. And they were always flying around taking photographs. Uh, and they would to order if you ask them. Well, obviously they did to order. Um, and one of the things they did, this raid was first planned in October 1941, and it was cancelled. But um, the result of that planning was a fantastic model, scale model of San Lazare. And that was made from photographs taken by this photographic reconnaissance unit. So they helped in that respect. Um, when the raid was... Um, finally to take place they flew over San Nazaire taking various photographs uh, and one of those uh, or two of those that they found was a that these um, five torpedo boats that I mentioned had arrived in San Nazaire and also there's a very good photograph of them you'll see this in my book um, having come out of the submarine basin and anchored uh, in line astern, in the middle of the fairway up to San Nazaire. And that was um, intelligence from the photographic reconnaissance unit. And it came in very late. The commandos and the forces were already um, assembled in Falmouth, ready to go, when a motorcycle 
um, courier arrived with those latest photographs of Somerset taken by the RAF. You know, this is this is a great story, and it's clear that there's just we're, we're barely scratching the surface. <laughs> um, but we are getting to be about that time now. So before before we end up yeah. here, I just wanted to ask you, how can people sort of learn more about you, learn more about the society, and how can they get your book? Well, nobody wants to know anything more about me. Um, certainly, they might like to know about some of my um, my researches and everything. There is the um, the society itself, of which anyone can join anywhere in the world. Um, and there is the um, website, uh, Operation Chariot and the Raid on Sanders Air. If you search those two, uh, you'll find a lot of information. And how can people get your book? Is it available on Amazon or? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I I know it's it's available in the states because uh, friends of mine over there have got it. Right. Right. Perfect. Perfect. So I will definitely. Uh, and if put... you can find five or six hundred friends who'd like to buy it, I shall be in your debt. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I will definitely put a link to your book in the yeah. uh, description of the video. So that uh, anyone who's interested, they can definitely go get a click and get direct access to uh, the book yeah. itself. If, if you're uh, able to access any of the uh, the bits and pieces in the in the DVD for anything you do, please do. I'm not in. I'm not into this for money. Nobody ever writes a book for money. Um, but um, I'm more interested in getting the story of the raid of Saint Nazaire um, put into the public domain. And remember, these guys have got to be remembered. That's what we're all about. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sending that to me. I will definitely keep you posted on uh, when this finally will air and when it's all edited and everything. And, uh, you know, when it's finally up on YouTube. Uh, so it'll be a, it'll right. be a good thing. Yeah. Well, I hope that's been helpful, Paul. Oh, absolutely. Very, very helpful. Um, so thank Don't you very afraid. much. Yeah, don't be afraid to come back with anything else you've got. And if you want to do another Zoom and ask me some questions, it's much nicer doing this. And it is keep sending impersonal emails. You know? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and we'll definitely do this again, because I guarantee you once this airs, I'm probably going to get a bunch of people who are going to ask more questions. So we'll have to do a part two.